together this morning, and I want to focus our time around the table and uh, looking at the uh, some of the the powerful message that the communion table brings towards us. We've had different themes over the last number of uh, times that we've done communion, and I want to turn your attention to a key idea that communion brings to us, the key idea of sacrifice. Sacrifice. And uh, as we think about that, I... Um, I want us to look at this passage of Scripture in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. I, I wonder if in the course of your lives there's been a moment, a point in time, when you've had a kind of eureka experience. You've seen something with clarity that you never had seen before. Perhaps it related to a decision you had to make, a career choice, marriage, investment opportunity, or, or whatever. The insight that you received brought clarity about the future, and you knew what you needed to do. It was truly life-transforming. Well, our text this morning tells us that Peter had such an insight, or the, or the verses just before our text this morning, tells us that Peter had such an insight. Jesus had asked his disciples, who do people say that I, the Son of Man, am? And the disciples had enumerated the various surmises that were going on in the society around them. And then Jesus turned to them and he said, but you, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, you know, speaking for the group, replied, You are the Christ. You are the Christ. Now, Peter saw something in that moment that he hadn't quite seen with the same clarity as he had before. Because what he was, in fact, saying is, Jesus, you are what the prophets predicted, the one who the prophets predicted would come. God was sending his Messiah, his Redeemer, the one who would change everything for his people. And what the prophet said would happen is happening in you. Since Jesus was the Messiah, then he was about to bring about radical transformation in their world. He was going to bring in the kingdom of God. He was going to bring the golden future the glorious future that the people of God longed for. And the disciples thought that in conjunction with Jesus, they too were going to share in that wonderful age to come. In fact, at one point, you remember James and John even asked Jesus that they might be granted privileged positions one on his right and one on his left in that kingdom that was going to come. You see, Peter saw something. Jesus was the Christ. But he misunderstood what Jesus was all about. Because Jesus goes on to dis, uh, and, and to, to dis and, and chant him about what that future was going to be. He goes on to say to him, Peter, your expectations are wrong. I'm here as the Messiah, indeed, but my messianic mission is different. And the messianic mandate that I have for you is not what you expect either. That's what we want to look at in these words. What was the messianic mission? And they're so closely tied to what these symbols are all about as we gather together in the presence of Jesus and share together at his table. What was the mission, Jesus said? Well, Jesus began to make that clear. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples about the glorious future they were going to share. No, that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer at the hands of the religious leaders 
and to die there. Jesus' mission, you see, was about sacrifice. The sacrifice of himself. We often, of course, speak of the ultimate sacrifice that people make, don't we? Perhaps we're speaking of military personnel. Perhaps we're speaking of peace officers in our country. They made the ultimate sacrifice. Well, there's a sense in which that's true. But they, their sacrifice has nothing in comparison to what Jesus was saying he was about to do. He had come, leaving behind heaven's glories, as Paul puts it in Philippians 2, hadn't he? He had taken on the form of human beings. He became a servant. More than that, he was obedient to death. God became a man so he could suffer and sacrifice himself for us. In fact, it is fair to speak here of God's sacrifice. Of himself. The Father would give his Son. Isn't that what that familiar verse says to us? God so loved that he gave his only begotten Son. The Son willingly went to the cross, laying down his life. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, No man takes my life for me, but I lay it down of my own accord, of my own will. The Spirit empowered <coughs> and enabled the Son to obey the will of the Father. You see, all of the triune God was involved in this great sacrifice that would radically transform our lives. This is how we learn what true love is all about. It's love expressed in the ultimate, truly the ultimate sacrifice. As Charles Wesley put it, amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Those are profound words. And that's what makes this sacrifice so truly amazing. It's interesting that Peter reacted as he did when Jesus said this to them. As he began to reveal the place of sacrifice in his mission, Peter protested, This shall never happen to you, Lord. This can't possibly happen. You can't be Messiah and have sacrifice as the center of your life. And yet Jesus turned to him and said to him, Satan, get behind me. Don't ever think the way of evil. Isn't that what Satan was about? Trying to divert Jesus from the central part of his life? What was the, the, the nature of the temptation that Satan brought to Jesus at the outset of his ministry? Wasn't it to turn him away from sacrifice? Don't you remember the words of Satan to Jesus? Simply cast yourself down and all people will flock to you. Or again, uh, simply bow the knee to me and all the kingdoms of the world will be yours. You'll rule because I will give them to you. Isn't that deter seeking to deter Jesus from the way of the Father? What was Jesus' response? Away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan. Because you are not uh, speaking the words and the will of God for me. And so Jesus resisted that. And you see, this is the amazing thing. How many of us would choose the way of sacrifice as the way of transformation? This morning, I was mentioning to Ian that last Sunday we were in a, a church that he and Evelyn a visit and, and, and attend when they're in the Florida area as well. And Curian and Lizzie are there and others. And So we went last Sunday. And this morning, just quickly as I was uh, getting ready for this morning, I turned to that service streams online at 8.30 and, and they were singing a song about the blood of Christ that transforms us. But you see, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Here's sacrifice that is transforming and life-changing for us. 
The world says that can't possibly be. But Jesus challenges that idea. And he says the ways of God are not the ways of people, fallen people under the, uh, the influence and authority of Satan. Scripture repeatedly tells us that transformation can only come through sacrifice. Because love, which sacrifice expresses, is the only thing that can fully and truly change us. At this table this morning, we are confronted with the raw reality that sacrifice is absolutely essential to salvation. The writer of the Hebrews put it this way, didn't he? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Apart from sacrifice, there can be no restoration to right relationship with God. Our world doesn't want to hear this. Even so-called Christians are denying this. Jesus simply is expressing his love. Yes, he is. But in that expression, he is sacrificing his life to bear the sin, the punishment of sin that you and I deserve. Don't be fooled to reject the notion of sacrifice as central to Jesus' mission is not to set our minds on the thinking of God. That's what Jesus says to Peter here. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human ideas. Sacrifice is crucial. Jesus sacrificed himself so that we can be reconciled to God, made part of his kingdom. I've mentioned 1 John 3, but this is how Jesus says we know, or John says we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Isn't that what we saw in 1 Peter 2 as well? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we could be reconciled to God. Have you put your trust in his work on your behalf? When you come to the table of the Lord, are you overwhelmed by sacrifice? The sacrifice of the one to whom these emblems point this morning. We're going to take a moment to contemplate that. Then I'm going to ask uh, Ian and, uh, to distribute the emblems to you. And we're going to participate of the bread before we do that. David will lead our thanksgiving for it. But let's just quietly for a moment pause to reflect on the sacrifice that these emblems point to. Ian, please.
David, would you leave our thanksgiving for the bread, please? Our Lord and God, Lord Jesus, come this time before you and take this bread, Lord, as some remembrance of your body, the righteous body that was broken for us, that we may be healed and made right with you to do your good will that you set before us now. Let's, Lord, remember this time, uh, your sacrifice for us, that we may be uh, continually doing your will. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's break the little tab and pull up the little plastic thing and access the wafer. You know, of the bread, Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. The second part of our text draws our attention, though, to Jesus' ongoing teaching. He talked about himself as the one who would sacrifice his life. But then he went on to say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He gave us a mandate. And that's what we need to realize is also embedded in these elements. You see, what's amazing here is that the way of the Messiah is declared to be the way of his followers too. If you want to follow me, there's a cross that you must take up. Now, I'm not talking here about a cross of, of illness or a cross of uh, some other burden that you're bearing. I'm talking about a cross on which we die to ourselves. One commentator said, Peter and all the apostles had now to learn that to follow Jesus meant to follow a crucified Jesus. Sacrifice is not just Jesus' agenda, it becomes our agenda too. We cannot join Jesus' company and participate in his work in any way except by sacrificing ourselves. That's what's being emphasized here for us. You know, we want to protect our lives naturally. But Jesus says here that if we protect our lives, if we take care of our own interests, we're going to lose our life. It's an upside-down way of thinking about things. And that starts with saying no to my own efforts. My own efforts first in terms of seeking reconciliation to God. The gospel is the gospel that you can't do anything to save yourself. The gospel is that Jesus has done it all, and we must trust him. And that means saying no to the natural desires of our hearts, to want to do and please God in our own strength. The gospel calls us to self-denial, to self-death in that sense. I cannot be good enough to deserve his love. You are more wicked than you can ever imagine. But you are more loved than you could ever believe. And that's what the gospel calls us to. But it goes on and says, not only must I rely totally on God for my salvation, but I must rely totally on him for my life. All of it. Every day. Every moment every hour. It's all on him. To this I hold, we say. My hope is only Jesus. In all of life, that is the case. At the heart of discipleship is the confession that Jesus is Lord. That has to be lived out. 
how we make life decisions is not about what I think will be good. It's about what Jesus says is the right and direct and godly way. Life decisions now change in the way that I make them. Whether it's the friendships I embrace, whether it's marriage or family or career, how we spend our money, how we use our time day by day, what we do with the talents God entrusts to us, all of those have to, have to be uh, mediated through this reality that I am dead to myself and I am alive to God. He is the one who must order my way. Jesus says that his followers had, are now those who invest themselves in his purposes. And in the process of doing that, they do not end up losing life, but discovering it in all of its fullness. And of course, Jesus goes on to say here that that's not only about what we get here or not here. It, it, it's something that transcends the here and now, and it has an eternal reality to it. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angel armies with him, then, then we're going to see what really is real, and what is God-honoring and god uh, electrifying, if you will, in our lives. You see, to participate in the cup is to say, I get it. It's to say, I realize that I have to die with Christ daily. I want him to have his way in my life and in my world. Again, as another commentator put it, death, is, death to self is a continuing prerequisite of following Jesus. I can't do this myself, but because of the supernatural work of Jesus, I am transformed. And that's what that song that I heard this morning was all about. The blood transforms me. The sacrifice of Christ changes me so that now I'm dead to myself so that I might live to God. What we confess when we take this cup and take it is not saying we're perfectly obedient, but it is saying our deepest desires are these. Lord, I want to live sacrificially as you have called me to live, to enable me to learn obedience daily as I follow you. I'm going to ask Ralph to lead our thanksgiving for the cup this morning. Remember that as we take it, this is what we are saying. We participate in the life of Christ. No, in the death of Christ. So that we might indeed participate in his life. Ralph, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice. Father, as Byron has already said, we take this cup and we give our lives to your glory. Father, I pray that as we do partake of this, we are reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the sacrifices that we have to make, which are pretty small compared to what he did. So, Father, uh, I just pray as we partake of this and as we go on and we, we remember your sacrifice in the, in the death of your son, Lord. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood, Jesus said, all of you drink it. <coughs> morning we've come into the presence of sacrifice. Sacrifice so great that we can't help but worship. 
But we've also heard in the sacrifice of our Lord a call, the call to lay down our own lives too. This is the way of transforming our own lives, of transforming our world, and of building God's kingdom. May your eating and drinking of this supper today be a way of your saying, you're all in to serve the Lord. Amen. Shall we pray? Lord, will you take these words and challenge our heart with them? I don't know where we are in life, each one of us. We're making decisions about careers, about friendships, about all kinds of things. Are we making them in light of your calling us to lay down our lives for you? We pray that that might be the case. Whether we're older or younger, Enable us to live in light of the cross. We thank you for what you're going to do in transforming each one of us and transforming our worlds for the glory of Jesus. We pray in his name. <coughs> Amen. We're going to sing together that wonderful old hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs>